Let's pray as we come to God's word together. Father, we want to echo those words and we thank you that you do build your church, you build your people through your word, by your spirit. And we pray you might do that again this morning for your glory in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I wonder if you recognize where these words are from. I'd like to build the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honey bees and snow white turtle doves. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I'd like to hold it in my arms and keep it company. Do you have any idea where those words are from? We've got some blank faces. Yeah, go on. Do you? Go on. It could well be the New Seekers. Yeah, it was popularized, for those of us who don't remember the New Seekers, uh, by a Coke advert in the 1980s before a load of you were actually born. Um, but do you remember that? It's not Joe Biden, it's the New Seekers. Alan Partridge did quote it. It is kind of cheesy, isn't it? And um, if you remember the Coke advert um, from the 80s, there was a whole diversity of people um, from every nationality and race who were brought together by, you guessed it, drinking Coke. It brought the um, whole world together in unity. And uh, what that advert, what that song taps into is a universal desire that we all have for peace and brotherly unity and a unity across all nationalities. Um, it's what so many different organizations try to achieve. So the Olympics, uh, here are the Olympic rings, and um, the goal of the Olympic movement, you'll find us on the website, is this, um, is to contribute to building a peaceful and better world by educating youth through sport. There we go. That's the Olympics. What about the United Nations? Uh, this symbol here. What does the symbol speak for? Um, you find us on, the, on their website as well. They speak of the hopes and dreams of people uh, the world over for peace and unity. Uh, so many organizations, European Union, maybe less so, but um, the Olympic movement, the United Nations, so many organizations that are there trying to bring peace and unity and togetherness. Uh, they tap into the longings of uh, the human heart that we could be at peace together and even at peace um, with God. You see, um, what the nations long for is what God is doing in the world. And do you know how God is doing it? Where he is bringing peace and unity between nation, between tribe and tongue, it is the church. You know, I don't know how highly you view the church. What we're going to do this morning is um, we're going to have a whistle-stop tour through the whole of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. So if you're at home um, and uh, you haven't got a strong cup of coffee, pause, go and get a strong cup of coffee. Um, if you're in the building, um, sorry, it's too late. You're in, you're buckled in. And um, if you've got a Bible, then brilliant. We're going to be flicking. We're going to do lots and lots of flicking um, this morning. Uh, but just to start with, um, the word church in the New Testament, it's ecclesia, the Greek word. It literally means gathering. Um, it means gathering. Uh, so as Gary said, it's not the denomination, it's not the building, it is a gathering physically of people. And that, it's actually originally a secular word. So in Acts chapter 19, um, there's been a massive riot in Ephesus. Uh, Acts chapter 19 verses 40 to 41, there it is on the screen, let me read it to you. Um, as it is, this is the town clerk calling to this huge group of people who've gotten together uh, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today in that case we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it after he said this he dismissed the church uh, the greek there is the ecclesia it's the same word for church it's an assembly See, it is a secular word, but obviously we want to fill that word with what the whole Bible says that it actually means. But at its heart, it is a gathering of people. That's why we're here this morning still, because <laughs> church means to physically gather. 
So let's start. Where does it start? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, the start of the Bible. And what we find here is a gathering in the garden. Now, um, you'll see on the screen some magnificent pictures. We have got 10 pictures that's going to take us through the whole Bible. And I would have drawn these on a, um, a chart at the front, but my wife said I'd mess them up. So um, we've drawn them and stuck them up. You'll be impressed by art history. It's, something, it's a re- something, something to behold. So let's have a look. Okay, Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28. We've got a gathering in the garden. And here we're going to see God's united people living under God's blessed rule over God's earth. Let me read verse 26. Uh, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. Uh, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground so God created mankind in his own image in the image of God he created them male and female he created them you see how does it start um, uh, before the mess of the fall how does humanity start with genuine unity and genuine diversity Uh, we've we are all male and female created in uh, the language of verse 26 and verse 27 the image of God absolute equality in mankind Uh, you could not get a greater dignity than being made in the image of the one who is of limitless value and worth the creator doesn't matter your nationality or your language, or your gender, or what football team you support, you're all equally made in the image of the divine. And yet there is also diversity uh, made in the image of God. Um, One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we have uh, male and female. Difference, and yet united together. See, there's great value. But also, um, humanity is together under God's rule. Just look at the start of um, verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. You see, God gives them instruction from the word go. And for those of you, as we get into chapter 2, who will know this, there's the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And I think that represents the, the blessing of being under God's eternal rule. And they've actually got a role to play as well. Humanity has got a role to play. We saw that in verse 28. What are they to do? They are to be fruitful and increase in number, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. You see, they are to reflect God as they rule, they reflect his rule as they rule over the world. And actually the plan for humanity was never that they stayed in the garden. It was always that they would spread out over the whole world under God's rule as Adam and Eve um, filled the earth with God-glorifying mini-me's. See, that was the world, the vision for the world. Uh, In perfect harmony, uh, with each other, with their maker, and singing together. Not a bottle of Coke in sight. But we know that that first gathering in the garden goes wrong. Because Genesis chapter 3, flick over. Genesis chapter 3. Um, the story goes that uh, Adam and Eve, uh, they believe the lies of Satan. Eve takes the fruit from the knowledge of uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, she says to God, we don't want to live under your the blessing of your rule and at that point as she and adam take the fruit uh, division enters into humanity's story there's division look at that you can see that picture as they grasp for god's there's division between them and god and them and each other just have a look at verse 16 of chapter 3 verse 16 of chapter 3 this is the curse that comes as a result of their rebellion Uh, verse 16 to the woman he said i will make your pains in childbearing very severe Uh, with painful labor you will give birth to children you'll um, give birth to your children Um, so what are they meant to be doing they're meant to be multiplying they're meant to be spreading out over all the world and all of a sudden that is made challenging Uh, c-sections become part of life drugs to get women through uh, childbearing and birth and even the process of childbearing will become more challenging it's a curse of the fall 
Uh, verse 17. Have a look what Adam, uh, what he tells Adam. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat the food from it all the days of your life. Subduing this earth uh, all of a sudden becomes really challenging. You know, there will be pandemics that kind of spoil work. Uh, you will build fantastic computers, but they will still have bugs and they will crash. Um, you will need to have a stitch in time to save nine because stuff will fall apart and it won't work so well. That is the curse. That is the fall. You know, this, this work and these roles that God set up to bless people um, are messed up. And you see the battle of the sexes start. Have a look at verse 16 again. Uh, to the woman, he said this stuff. And he said, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And neither of those are in a God-glorifying and good sense. Uh, they are conflict and enmity and division uh, between male and female, between husband and wife. You see, this is not teaching the world to sing, but giving the world over to shouting and screaming at each other in perfect disharmony. See, on a horizontal level, Genesis 3, it is a mess. And on a vertical level, it's a disaster. They are cut off from God. Just have a look at verse 24. Verse 24. After he drove the man out, he placed him on the east side of the Garden of Eden, cherubim and a flashing sword, flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Um, Adam and Eve are thrown out of the garden and, and it is a picture of being cut off from relationship with their maker. They used to walk with him in the cool of the day and now they are given over to life east of Eden. As you read through Genesis, it gets further east and east and east as the relationship with God gets more and more distant and they are not just cut off from God. As they are cut off from God, they are given over to death. From dust you were taken, and to dust you will return. From such heights of Genesis 1, this is a desperate, breathtaking fall. Now, I don't know how many of you will remember the 26th of November in uh, 2009. You probably won't remember it as a date, but if I told you that was the day that Tiger Woods crashed his car into a lamppost... Now, um, for those of you who don't know, Tiger Woods uh, was uh, probably the, one of the best known people in the world. He was one of the greatest golfers the world has ever seen. His name was up there. He, the, the sponsorship deals were insane. How much money he was earning. He, everything he touched turned to gold. The world was at his feet and he crashed his car into a lamppost. And from that night on, everything unraveled. Um, all the skeletons came out of the closet. Uh, his marriage broke up. His golf fell to pieces. All his sponsors dropped him. And he's never been the same since. It was such a fall from grace. But that is nothing on humanity's story. Life will never be the same again. Genesis 3. Uh, sin separates us from each other, from God. Um, east of Eden, it's not great. And there's a sense that we all carry that, don't we? There's a sense inside of us we think, this is not how life is meant to be. The guilt we carry, the reality of suffering, the pervasiveness of death. Atheist author Julian Barnes, he puts it like this, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. See, we all long for a return to Eden. The unity, the peace between man and woman, between humanity and God, between humanity and the world. And it gets worse. Go on to chapter 11. Go on to Genesis chapter 11, where we get the godless gathering at Babel. Look at that magnificent picture. I hope at uh, home you're appreciating my wife's work. It was my wife's work. <laughs> Look at that. What do we see in the godless gathering at Babel? Uh, we see people with one language, one location, self-promoting and trying to demote God. Let me read um, verse 1 and 2. Now the whole world uh, had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, do you notice that? East of Eden. 
They found a plain in Shinar and settled there. There they are going east of Eden, further and further away. And they are working together. Um, But it's a bit like a coalition government. They kind of hate each other. But they're still working together for a common goal. Have a look at verse 3. What are they doing? Uh, They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Uh, They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, "Uh, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the whole face of the earth what are they doing um it's an incredible piece of technology this is impressive engineering uh, they've worked out how to make bricks and they're going to say look we're going to make a massive tower why verse three actually verse four to make a name for ourselves they're meant to be glorifying god and actually they want to glorify themselves and this tower that is reaching up to the heavens it's not so much about them trying to build a tower to reach up Um, to God to get closer to him it's more getting a tower so high so they can be on the top looking over and being God themselves that's what they are doing and so what does God do verse 4 it's brilliant what does God do Um, in fact verse 5 but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people we're building. You see, this is brilliantly condescending. Uh, there they are. Look at this massive tower we're building. It's pretty impressive, guys, isn't it? We've been slogging our guts out. And look how high it is. And God has to go from heavens. I can't. I can't actually see it. Are they doing something down there? Are they doing something? I'm. Well, guys, can you? Is he? Are they do? I'm just going to go down and have a look. And he has to go down to have a look at this very impressive tower they are building because in big terms it is so small and pathetic and here is God's verdict verse 6 then he said if as one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them And actually, what you've got to understand there is if we'd read the other chapters of Genesis, uh, then you'd realize just how wicked people's hearts are. See, what he is saying here is that we cannot leave humanity to be able to communicate in this one way. If we think the gulags are bad or um, uh, the concentration camps, then just think what humanity unleashed together could do. And so God, in his mercy, will not allow humanity to do this. And so verse 7, he says, Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. See, God confuses their languages, as you can see there on that beautiful diagram. And he spreads them out. He preserves his glory. It is, it is in his grace, but it is also in his judgment you see um when he's talking about confusing their languages it is not for us to go those people when i see those people speaking in welsh that's the judgment of god not english is fine but welsh it is um i think this idea of um diverse languages uh, gets to a much bigger issue you see um in genesis chapter 10 there's already some different languages before the tower of babel and when we get to the new heavens and the new earth there will be tribe every tribe and tongue and nation and i don't think in in heaven that means we'll all be speaking the same language i think there'll be people speaking welsh and swahili and uh, german and english and all sorts of language in heaven i think we'll just be able to understand each other because i don't think one language has got a monopoly on um convene uh, expressing the truth but anyway you can take me up on that later but what i think he is saying here is that they are confused not just in language but at heart level um at, at the lang- at the level of not really being able to understand each other on a world view level which their already sinful hearts will take and create hostility See, as God confuses things, our hearts divide us. And so you get the culture wars that we see so prevalent in the States. We get the, the belief systems that divide us, the racism, the classism, the snobbery, the sexism. It's driven deep. 
And I, th- I think we're left realizing that someone being able to run the 100 meters in under 10 seconds or jump over a stick onto some padded foam mat is not actually going to be able to un- truly unite the world. See, the confusion runs deep. The Olympics, the UN, Coca Cola, it's a failed project. It's not going to work. It can't deal with the rifts that have become between us and our sinful hearts. It's not going to be able to deal with the rifts between us and God. But praise God, Genesis 12 comes after Genesis 11. Because into the darkness of um, Genesis chapter 11, we get the light of Genesis chapter 12. And uh, just have a look on. Genesis chapter 12. You see, here we meet Abraham. God picks him out from the nations. And he promises him a land, a people, and a blessing. Just have a look at verse 2. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. You see, here he is promising Abraham kind of what we were lost at what was lost at Eden you know there there was division here is a great nation in Genesis chapter 3 there was curse and curse and curse and can you believe it in Genesis chapter 12 there is blessing it's a reversal and then chapter 3 verse 3 have a look at verse 3 Uh, I will bless you, bless those who bless you, whoever curse you, I'll curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Through this uh, tribe of united people, all nations will be blessed. See, after Babel, all the, after Babel, all the nations are going to be blessed. The confusion and division reigning from the last chapter, he's saying there will be some healing, there will be some bringing together through the promises made to Abraham. And those will come um, uh, as his descendants. And we start seeing this being fulfilled in Exodus chapter 19, where we next get, get our next gathering. Let's have a look. It's a gathering at the mountain. Exodus chapter 19. Now, the Bible story is going at a pace at this point. Uh, God's people have ended up in Egypt because of Joseph and his technicolor dream coat. You might remember that. And uh, they grow into this great nation numerically. Pharaoh hates them. He oppresses them. He makes them slaves. And God, in his mercy, rescues them. He redeems them. Uh, Here are a people who have walked through a sea on the seabed they've they've seen two walls of water and as they've got through the other side they've seen their oppressive slave masters crushed by these waves of water and um, they are at the base of this mountain and it's kind of like um like a really good glastonbury there's two million of them intense a festival experience like no other um god's presence manifests itself at the top of the mountain and um we see a recapturing of what was lost at Eden. Uh, let me read verses 3 to 5 of um, Genesis, Exodus chapter 19. Then Moses got up to the mountain and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my commandments, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasure possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak um, to the Israelites see what we have here is firstly a gathered people they are gathered they are together this promised nation they are here they are a gathered redeemed people verse 4 God has rescued them he has paid a price to enable them to be his people and if you know the story of Exodus it is the price of the first is the blood of the lamb Uh, It's the blood of the lamb that has had to be spilt to enable these people to be rescued, not just from slavery under Pharaoh, but from the wrath of God that came over the whole land of Egypt. A lamb died in the place of the firstborn son and was daubed on uh, the doors so that death would not come to that house. Um, It cost a lamb. Uh, Let's see the picture. Can you see the lamb? 
on the diagram they're the people together under God's rule and he also gives them his laws verse 6 they are under his rule Uh, there's a unity under what God says so they are redeemed people Uh, they are a gathered redeemed people and they are under the blessing of his rule and do you know what the Bible says this meeting is the first church this is the first church don't believe me okay acts chapter 19 this verse is going to come up on the screen uh, stephen is giving a speech where he does a bible overview uh, just before he gets um, stoned to death and he says this he was in the assembly the ecclesia or i guess you could call it the church in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on mount sinai and with our ancestors and he received living words to pass on to us see stephen looks back at that moment and he says that first gathering there it is a prototype church and actually it is uh, it is the remaking of eden it's the restart of Eden. Well, as you read through um, uh, the Bible, you'll get to 1 Kings um, 8 to 10. And this is the high point. We're not going to look at it. We don't have time. There's a gathering in Jerusalem. There's a temple. Uh, there's the law. Um, there's a king. Uh, the queen of Sheba comes and goes, wow, I want to know what you've got. The nation seems to be blessed through that nation. But then sin rips this prototype to shreds. Uh, There are bad kings. If you flick on to the next one. There are bad kings and sinful hearts. There is still division and it just doesn't work. And you leave basically the Old Testament realizing we need something more than the blood of a a lamb, a bar, a sheep. (laughs) We need something bigger than that. And what we need is the death of the eternal son of God let's flick on to Ephesians chapter 2 Ephesians chapter 2 which was the passage we had read you see what do we need to be able to bring people back together Um, it is it's the cross it's Jesus death this is Eden undone Um, uh, this is sorting out the problem of Eden let's have a look at verses 14 Uh, to 15 you see the law which was meant to bring lots of aspects of blessing together ended up being um, something that divided people jew and gentile and have a look at verses 14 um, through uh, and 15 let me read it for he himself is our peace who has made two groups one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to god through the cross by which he put to death their hostility you see um God has made peace, verse 14. Uh, He's making peace, verse 15. Uh, There is a oneness in verse 15 and verse 16. Um, God, through the cross, has brought disjointed and warring people together, Jew and Gentile. How does he do that? Well, both the Jew and the Gentile get right with God in exactly the same way. It is on their knees before the lord jesus and his death Uh, it's not that one is in the moral sense of things able to run the hundred meters below 10 seconds and um, able to make themselves right with god no they're both in humility brought together as the message of peace verse 17 with god is, is is brought to them in exactly the same way only by trusting Um, the death of jesus are they able to do it his death is a wrecking ball it smashes through this wall of hostility the law and commandments that divide them both in humility they can be genuinely united both together and with god Uh, it's interesting that john the baptist when he sees jesus what does he call him he says look 
There is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. Uh, Gary read this at the start of the service. Acts 20 verse 28. He says this, um, Be shepherds of the church of God, which he has bought with his own blood. See, the church can have genuine peace because God in his loving kindness was willing to sacrifice his son. Now, I love my girls. I love them. I think they're great fun. But if you were to ask me to sacrifice one of them for one of your lives, not a chance. As lovely as you are. But the God of the universe thinks you, thinks humanity is so precious that in love he gives his son to bring unity, to bring peace between humanity, to bring peace between him and us. It's amazing. See, those curses of Eden are undone. Ah, wow, the start of them being undone is at the cross. And actually, have a look at um, Acts chapters 2 to 4. We see Babel being undone. At Pentecost, when God pours out the Spirit on his people and they preach out. Let me just go. Acts chapter 2, um, verse uh, 11. Um, here we have um, the apostles preaching to a crowd. They're from a whole bunch of tribes, tongues, and nations. And listen to this. Both Jews and converts, Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, they say this. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Uh, they have people hearing this message of the cross and responding to it in faith and being united with each other and united with God. And have a look at chapter 4, verse 32. Look at what, how he describes God's people as a result of uh, the Spirit's work and what Jesus done. All the believers were one in what? One in... All the believers were one in... Can you read it? It's really small. One in heart they're one in heart they're one in mind and they share all their possessions um, there is genuine unity at the world view level at the heart level you know the olympics may give us a high as we unitedly cheer on uh, someone doing some incredible feat um, as a record is broken probably by a drug-filled athlete but it's not true unity the UN can't do this. NATO can't do this. Coca-Cola can't do this. Only God by his spirit through the good news about Jesus that brings together the church. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Common worldview, value set, purpose and love. It is supernatural. And do you know what? When I see some of the small groups, when I see the diversity even within our church family it's remarkable there's a small group where you've got an anesthetist and a cleaner and a teacher and a computer programmer treating each other as equals valuing praying for each other where else do you get that in life see the church even though flawed this side of the new creation is something that is beautiful and it speaks of an eternal reality. And I said I was going to work you hard. And look, just finally, Revelation 7, 9, 12. Let's just get this up on the screen. See, there will be an eternal gathering. The gatherings here point forward to that gathering. Can you see they've all got held hands to show they've got held hearts? They're all together worshipping before the throne. Look at it. Um, um, chapter 7, verse 9. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count every nation tribe people language standing before the throne and before the lamb and they were wearing white robes and holding palm branches and they cried out in a loud voice salvation belongs to our god who sits on the throne and to the lamb you see you have this gathered people every tribe tongue and nation there are gathered redeemed people there before the lamb on the throne who has bought them with his blood and they are the gathered, redeemed people enjoying the blessing of being under God's rule. 
See, if you'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony, this is the only way it's going to happen. You know, I just wonder, uh, do you see the church in the way the Bible puts it? Uh, right at the heart of what God is doing in the universe. Uh, the hope <laughs> that actually all of humanity is longing for. And even though we still struggle with sin, each little church here, Surrey Chapel, um, the little church of the railway mission, uh, they're like little gems all over Norwich, shining out into a dark world, God's plans and purposes for the universe. They are precious to him. He loves them, these little gems. Here in Norwich, all over Norfolk, all over the United Kingdom, all over the world, pointing everyone to where the universe is heading. And people long for it. You know, I think one of the things the pandemic has done for us is it's helped us, again, it's taught us the value of gathering. Maybe we were taking it for granted. Maybe we were taking it for granted being able to sing and talk to each other and actually physically be together. And we've been separated and boy, we've missed it, haven't we? You know, all of a sudden, uh, when we were like, oh, am I going to go to church today? It's quite sunny. I might go to the beach. Now we know, no, we really need to be together. Why? It's the heart of what God is doing in the universe. You know, where is it in your priority list? This local expression of what God is doing everywhere. Well, let's pray as a church. We will treat the church in the way that God treats it. And we'll see it as the hope for humanity. Let's bow our heads. And I'll just give you a few moments to respond to the Lord in your own heart. You've done very well hanging in there. Father oh God, sorry for the times where um, we have not placed uh, the church and the work you are doing through your people um, in our hearts, in our lives, in the place it should be. And Father, this morning again, we want to join with the song and the chorus of heaven, the song that we will sing one day, that salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Uh, he is worthy of praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh,